Okay, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for everyone coming along in person. You got to see the uh, protection augmented landscape in, uh, in all its tactile glory. And for those who are online, maybe pop in and visit me sometime and then you can sort of have a touch and a play uh, with, the, with the tech, which I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I've got approximately 800 slides to get through today, so I'll, 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 I'll get, get on with it. That's so much. <laughs> if this, okay, so as Katarina mentioned, um, I've been, my work's been associated with CDU for almost 20 years now. I've been working in Territory for about 25 years, in Alice Springs, Northern Territory across Northern Australia. Uh, but much of that time has also been working in Eastern Indonesia, so for about 15 years, um, working primarily in Sumba, Flores and uh, West Timor, as well as working in, across Northern Australia, supporting best practice fire, um, fire management. Um, and through that time, working in what I think is um, the most interesting part of Australia and working with our wonderful close neighbours, um, uh, working with some really interesting sort of cross-cultural interfaces and my role has been trying to support the use of appropriate technology and in that role I'm a, saying that I'd like to work at the very blunt edge of technology. There's so much that we've got which uh, is simple, it works, it's robust and can be applied to support local knowledge. Um, the cutting edge is uh, what I call a sort of techno fetishism, where we're more interested in the technology than we are the people that use it. But um, particularly in the space where I'm working, it's really been about how I can support local knowledge. Um, so I'll be talking about some of these applications, particularly in relation to supporting uh, fire management in uh, Eastern Indonesia. My background is what's sort of a remote sensing uh, GIS background hence me sitting on the floor with maps there. So through this um, uh, presentation today, I'll talk about uh, this projection augmented landscape model method or approach that I've been applying across Northern Australia and around the world, um, how that applies to mapping cultural knowledge and some of those projects. Um, and related to that and connected to this is my real interest in uh, complex systems and gamification, how they support um, training and education. So my start in this world of uh, projection augmented landscapes, and I'd really like to acknowledge the amazing work that developed by a group called SimTable, I believe they're a Californian-based company. <laughs> and they were taking techniques which have been long used by um, emergency services and the military where um, you use uh, physical 3D models of uh, an area that you are responding to. Um, particularly emergency services, um, sand models have been often used and people make little sort of trees out of bits of paper and matchbox cars and that's a way to talk through um, a, a particular response. What SimTable did was project over the top of that quite sophisticated uh, fire simulations. So I saw this about 10 years ago and I could immediately see how this could support um, sort of cross-cultural discussions um, around the complexity of good land management in Northern Australia. At that time, I thought I'd never be able to do that because um, not particularly clever sort of fellow. So, um, but luckily, I met, around that time, I met a guy from CADAT uh, called Dr. Scott Heckbert, who introduced me to some simulation modeling tools called NetLogo, um, which I then went off and started to play around uh, developing fire simulations and initially sort of using sand as my base. This guy, Scott, then sort of started to look, we really quite like what I was doing in that space. He then started to look at uh, 3D printing for uh, developing the base uh, landscape models. So then I did some more work with Scott. So it's been a real collaboration um, between this guy and Kata and myself um, and have since um, largely been using the 3D printed um, format for projection augmentation. Um, but I still very much like the, the sand approach as well. So I'll be talking to, to both. So this is an example for people online. You can't see the model here in, um, in person um, of how it looks. So we've got these 3D printed tiles projecting over the top, uh, these multiple spatial data sets, um, and then um, being able to animate simulations. But it's really just placing these tiles in place. Um, and it does look quite spectacular. It does have that sort of eye candy effect. It brings people in to really concentrate and look at what you're talking about, um, regardless of uh, their, their background. 
So I call them sort of tactile holograms. I mean, it's a bit, bit of a gammon way to describe it, but um, it is a bit of both. So for me, the key to this approach is that it's multi-sensory, it's multi-dimensional, and it encourages play and discussion when talking about uh, complex situations. The multi, you know, the other term I like to use is making the uh, digital physical, um, trying to make things tactile and, and that sort of embodied sort of discussion and learning again. And we know through decades of research um, that uh, people learn through multiple pathways, this sort of multimodal learning or multi-sensory learning. But more and more, um, our teaching, particularly through COVID, has become this sort of static two-dimensional screen-based thing. You know, we live our lives with sort of hand phones in front of our faces most of the time. And we know that's not the best mode for learning. To learn, you need to be able to touch, you need to be able to walk, you need to be able to talk, you need to be able to see other people. And I think there's a real opportunity as we're sort of bringing people back into the classroom to explore that again. And uh, it's not just for children, physical or embodied learning works for everybody. And this creating a multi-dimensional world for me is very important as well. So being able to place yourself uh, in the landscape, we know that we all, people always navigate based on landmarks, whether they be built landmarks or hills. That's how we sort of move through the world. When you look at a two-dimensional map, a lot of people are immediately lost because you can't see that dimensionality. Mm. Also, when you're thinking about how places or spaces or landscapes work, they work in three, three dimensions. If you want to understand where water flows, where fire flows, where people move, it's all in three dimensions. So making that explicit, I think is really useful. I call this uh, sort of four dimensional uh, uh, landscapes because uh, through the projection, I can add these sort of dynamic and interactive uh, simulations. So adding that dimension of time, because we also move in four dimensions, our, our lives are lived in four dimensions. So for me, that, that's important. And this idea of thinking through play, you know, most of the really complex or difficult human ecological problems that we're dealing with at the moment don't have answers. There's not a solution. And you, we really just cast sort of science out what is the best thing to do. It's really about people engaging with each other um, and thinking through with their local knowledge about the outcomes and where they want to get. And most of the uh, most wicked problems are these complex system problems where there's emergent properties and unexpected outcomes and we can't predict what's going to happen. But you can think about the boundary, bounding states of these complex systems and how you might sort of deal with them. So I'm going to be talking more about complex systems and understanding complex systems um, towards the end of this presentation. But for me, that's a really important aspect of this. Similarly, this idea of supporting local knowledge. Um, once again, you can't um, simply sort of uh, empirically quantify the, uh, the complexity of local problems, local issues, local cultures, and how they interact with landscapes. So this idea of having what I call a stage in which we can share knowledge, people can share knowledge amongst themselves. And it's not necessarily about capturing knowledge, but sharing that in a dynamic way. For me, that's, that's really important. And particularly, as I said, in the context that I work across Northern Australia and East Indonesia, I never pretend to understand what's going on. You know, for, for me, the people who are, you know, have their multiple PhDs in um, the important things to local places, to local people, and giving them the opportunity to share that knowledge either with each other intergenerationally or if they want outside. I think for me, that's, that's the most important thing. And, we're, and I like the idea that uh, with these projection augmented landscapes, as soon as I turn off that light, there's no, there's, you can see the terrain contours, but there's nobody else's information there and we haven't captured any information. So I've done a lot of work in this participatory GIS space. And a lot of that's about capturing people's knowledge. I'm not interested in that. As soon as you turn the light off, the knowledge is gone, but there is the knowledge of that shared stories at the time. So once again, this idea of something which is multi-sensory, multi-dimensional, encouraging play, ways that we can reconfigure the way that we think, interact, and we can learn together.
So some of the applications, I'll talk about some um, applications from quite a few years ago uh, first and then stuff that I've been doing more recently. Um, so this idea again uh, of inter intergenerational knowledge exchange, two-way learning, and particularly these uh, initial uh, projects, the empowerment of Indigenous knowledge, which has been in these fields dominated by scientific data. So the first example is from uh, Dimaru, um, uh, working with Dimaru Aboriginal Corporation up in Gove, and they were developing their fire management plans for um, their land management area, but it was quite complex because they've got the big mine site there. Mm -hmm. They've also got tourists coming in. So they had quite a few different stakeholders and issues they had to deal with. So we started this um, using sand as the base. So we had, the photos are very good, but uh, we had a mine worker, a non-Indigenous ranger coordinator, an emergency service guy, an Indigenous ranger coordinator, all on the hands and knees, sort of setting up the sand. And basically you need to have the sand very approximately sort of fitting with the elevation. So here red is high and blue is low. And as soon as you project over that top of that, um, this sort of hill shaded relief, your brain does this amazing thing and fills in all this complexity and it actually looks like a really detailed landscape. But the fact that we had everybody doing this together on the floor in the first place just changed the way people interacted for the rest of the workshop. So one of the, uh, the rangers there sort of commented, everyone should acknowledge both Yonru and Malanda, everyone felt comfortable, not shy when talking to each other about that uh, fire simulation. And the fire simulation that we ran over this after, it didn't need to be accurate. It needed to be able to support the stories that those local rangers were telling. And if it did something wrong, that was also quite good because they could say, well, this is not how it worked. This is how it worked. So that was a really useful exercise. Um, this next example is out at, uh, with uh, RF Europe rangers um, in central Arnhem land. And this was a workshop over a few days where at night time, I set up my 3D sort of uh, digital sand pit fire and we had a sort of real campfire um, a few metres away. So we had this sort of digital version and then a, a, camp, a, camp, a real campfire version. But people were exchanging sort of stories um, about these. And the kids loved this um, playing around with the uh, digital version. Um, and they were able to talk about that sort of landscape scale fire management. and. Then the next day we would sort of go out and do some burning and I, I learned a lot on the ground. So um, I go, yeah, so that's what it looked like once we sort of, that's just really roughly piled sand. But once you put the projection over the top, you get this sort of detailed relief. I think something which gives a sense of height and texture really makes a, a huge difference. The other thing I used to do, I'm not doing this so, so much now, but had an infrared light detector where you could actually use a cigarette lighter to spark up the digital fire. Um, and, and the kids loved that, you know, the eight-year-old was helping the four-year-old light up the cigarette lighter to get these digital fires going across. But that extra sort of a bit of sort of tactility was quite fun. I'm not doing that so much anymore just because it just it's another widget, another gadget that can sort of go wrong and not work all the time. Uh, yeah, so I work, worked for many years with uh, Myanmar um, Land Management Corporation near Bulman, Wimal, um, also in central Arnhem Land. So I produced for them a large uh, 3D printed landscape, and this was specifically taken up by the, the women rangers as a tool for them both to develop uh, more of their sort of IT skills, but they also, so there they are. We, this was at one of the Territory NRM conferences, um, but they used it quite a bit at uh, the primary school in Bullman to talk about what the, their ranger group was doing out on country. And this was really great because I set it up, um, did a little bit of training and then left. And I haven't seen it for about uh, five or six years, um, but I know it's still being used. And that's really, a lot of the work I've done since has been some more FIFO stuff where I only set this up and do a, run a workshop and um, disappear again. But this is sort of gold standard to me where I can set something up, build capacity, and then it's not no longer my tool to operate or my story to tell with this sort of stuff. So really good work with um, Mimal. Um, also been working for a few years, the Indigenous Land Sea Corporation, who are supporting a whole bunch of um, uh, carbon abatement fire management projects. Um, one of their first one was in Jukbara Grigory National Park in the Victoria, Victoria River District, uh, East Kimberley. 
Um, and in this park, there were um, three different uh, landowner or ranger groups, the Timber Creek group, um, the Waterman group, and then the Kalkarinji rangers. And they all had to go through a process of understanding what the fire management project was about. So we would go to these fairly remote camps, like four or five hours down um, dirt four dry tracks, parks in T set up my little sort of um, 3D projection um, tarp tent in there under the bio, and then we'd have a generator out the back, start that up and set this projection up. And something about this technology, which is neat, is that uh, it's never not worked. It's super robust. All I'm doing is putting projector down. I must say one of these, uh, one of these workshops that did get to about 45 degrees inside was temp during the day and the projector ended up turning off. So it was better doing it at night anyway. But, um, this was great. So all the kids, everywhere I've been, you know, everywhere in the world, you know, kids five or six years, they've all had um, exposure to computers and they some playing games. So they'd be there, all the kids, they'd be playing, burn the place down. They were there engaged. But then you'd get all the people who would be telling the story about that landscape and the, their knowledge. And then I would disappear. It's not, not my not my story to tell. And that very much happened in that uh, Arafira swap um, uh, uh, application there as well. And uh, I didn't understand what they were saying anyway. So as much as I could then leave that as something that I've set up to support that intergenerational knowledge exchange, um, it's really, really very useful. Uh, we also did it uh, on sand at night. Um, one of the rangers grabbed a, a passing python and, and threw it on the top. I, I'm not quite sure what the point of that was, but and a little bit more as a tactile excitement to the whole thing, I guess. Oh, yeah, 2018, I won this sort of uh, national Australian Financial Review <laughs> Award for this work um, for um, <coughs> education technology, um, which then led within the Northern Territory to absolutely nothing. So I don't know the value of these sort of awards, but I thought that I'd <laughs> uh, mention it. Um, I mean, we, I felt we are so obsessed with what I think are technological cliches as opposed to um, pursuing things which I think are actually uh, have impact in terms of supporting local knowledge. Um, and I know on this university there's been a lot of emphasis on VR and AR and all that sort of stuff, which um, and I'd say, well, I just want this award. And I'd say, oh, that, oh we're, we're doing something we call innovation, which I hate that word. All right, anyway, move on. That's my right. Um, Around that time, I also did a bit of work for the Amateur Melpa Corporation. So this is uh, Western Australia, Geraldton. So this is a 3D print of that whole Geraldton Shire where there was a huge land claim went through about two or three years ago around the time that I did this work. And I've just got a relief display over there, but we had all sorts of knowledge being displayed over the tunnel. And here we've got Ben Wyatt, the um, uh, WA Minister for um, uh, Indigenous affairs at the time, I think. Um, now using that to explain to him about the process of that land claim. So this is what I found. It's good for explaining very quickly, often quite complex stories to more senior people as much as it is for knowledge exchange at the at more junior level. So yeah, that was good. I was able to develop that for the Yamacha Malpa group and they sort of took it off and used it as they saw fit. So a lot of that has been fire-related stuff. I um, just want to talk about some work with um, uh, water. Um, so this is work that was conducted by the guy I mentioned at the start of um, the presentation, um, Dr. Scott Hepburn. Uh, he lives in um, Edmonton, a lot of work in Calgary. They've actually got mountains and hills to print there, which is nice. Um, so he was modelling water flow from um, the Canadian Rockies um, and into Calgary, um, and looking at some large flood events. And he found that having water flow in 3D, water tends to work in 3D, um, really helped people understand how that worked. Uh, this is an example. I, I ran quite a large um, project looking at small scale and artisanal mining in uh, West Timor for a number of years. And this is, we're up in the mountains of West Timor, and I was trying to find sand that we could do this for. Of course, there's no be beaches near the mountains of West Timor, but there is a lot of lime. So we chucked down a whole bunch of lime and then we projected it, this model of the mountains of West Timor. And it had this really simple sort of water flow model that you could sort of click this infrared light pen and we show the flow from a potential mine site sending it down that, uh, down that hill. So it was quite a fun application. 
Um, so just some international work. So I took this to um, uh, Mexico a number of years ago now, and this was sort of on the back of a uh, international participatory GIS conference where I met uh, this guy, Mark McCall, who's sort of the sort of international sort of leading sort of academic around participatory uh, GIS applications. He's based in um, uh, Mexico, so uh, presented some of this work over there, and they immediately saw the application in terms of working with local knowledge. And uh, in this case, uh, they 3D printed this um, one area where they were working with local farmers and looking tr at traditional agricultural practices and soil erosion. So they were putting some of their local, mm -hmm. so their scientific uh, modelling of soil erosion and then <laughs> getting that local knowledge to get people to talk about their traditional practices. So I've since um, done quite a bit of work with these guys in Mexico and they've actually written a whole um, manual on the projection augmented landscape modeling work that I've done um, in Mexican, so sorry, in Spanish, um, which I can't read, but um, <laughs> I'm a co-author on this um, uh, publication. Um, it's with the National University of Mexico now, soon to be published, I hope. So um, yeah, hopefully that will gain a bit more traction in Latin America. But I do find, um, particularly Latin America and Southeast Asia, um, the work that they are doing in that sort of mapping of local knowledge, um, that sort of participatory mapping space is uh, a long way ahead of what I've seen in the more developed world. Um, and they can really see the value of it. Um, so around that time, I also did some work in um, Cameroon. Um, it's with a... Um, a project trying to support uh, local Indigenous uh, hunters, um, sometimes known as pygmy or baka pygmy, um, and understanding their um, hunting practices in relation to other hunters that were coming into more commercial bushmeat trade. So my component of that, again, was really just um, creating the 3D landscape and creating a template of format to project a lot of the knowledge that these guys had collected, so the local hunters can, had collected, but also as part of this local uh, project. I had been told that uh, the Baka were pretty um, hard to impress um, and we sort of set this up in a church and they sort of came in and they're like, you know, what's all this about? And I thought it looked pretty cool. They weren't that impressed. But um, one of the things I had on this was what they had done is collect GPS tracks of all of their hunting routes over a year. And then within this interactive interface, you could press a button and then you'd have the um, hunter sort of moving over the landscape. And as soon as they saw their knowledge depicted on this, particularly in a dynamic way, this is the, the response that we got. And they just could see the relevance to them. So that was nice. They weren't that amazed by the whole projectional minted blah, 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 but their knowledge being in that form, that's really useful. Um, and then also particularly useful is um, in Yaoundé, so in town, it's a really useful way for uh, the NGO and the academics working on this project to explain what they were doing in this space. So. Yeah, being able to communicate uh, both the scientific no local knowledge. Um, so that's still there. I haven't heard how it's being used um, in Cameroon subsequently, but um, I'm currently printing this huge island off the um, east coast of Africa for another related project funded by BirdLife International, which would be a similar thing, sort of looking at local knowledge and conservation and how you balance those things. Working with this amazing guy, Claude Garcia, who's done a lot of work creating um, like board games, like with cards and blocks and this sort of thing, where you get large stakeholder groups together to work through complex uh, human ecological problems, but through these strategy and board games. And I really like the tactility of that sort of work. So trying to combine the sort of stuff that I'm doing with these sort of strategy game approaches to work through those complex problems. So that's stuff from a few years ago. This is what I'm doing um, now. Um, so stuff that I've sort of started in 2021 and 2022. So slowly inhabiting the North Australian space. Um, and I want to start by talking to work that I've been doing with a group called Centre Farm, which is associated with the Northern Land Council and Central Land Council. Their Centre Farm set up to support uh, Indigenous horticultural um, development or projects. 
So their first area is uh, in Ali Karal. It's near where there's that massive sort of uh, groundwater claim that's sort of under dispute at the moment. Ali Karal, they've got a little watermelon farm. They just started planting garlic. But an important key component of that first for this project and also Mataranka was um, cultural mapping. So they've been working with a, uh, an artist um, and uh, knowledge, cultural knowledge mapping person called Kim Mahud. Some of you may have heard of. Um, she's written some really interesting work around this space. Um, so this is the sort of stuff that she does. She sits down with a very large canvas, and on that canvas they paint um, the knowledge that people come up with around the way the landscape's used or sort of old stories, green time stories. And then what I'm doing is then geographically correcting that and then projecting it in this 3D space. And then in the 3D, we can also have more sort of dynamic animations or other data around groundwater. And so incorporating that um, traditional knowledge um, and some of the scientific knowledge. It was a little bit of a challenge when I started to print on the because it's dead flat. It's like, why am I printing this space? But it is linked on to the Davenport Ranges, which is um, to the east, which we included in the model, because that's really key for understanding the sort of groundwater dynamics of that landscape. Um, so this is from a couple of weeks ago. This is the other location where um, up around Manaraka with um, the uh, traditional owners. That country also have a, a water license, um, so they could potentially start to um, uh, develop horticultural in some of that country. But the, really the first step is this sort of long sort of cultural mapping process, and that's sort of kin there. It's my 3D landscape, and this is very much a work in progress. One thing I did learn, though, is that uh, these tiles, it comes with thermal plastic, and if you leave those hot tiles in a car in Mataranka for a week, where it's over sort of 70 degrees in the car, <laughs> they all sort of melt and add sort of rubber bands around them. That sort of went a bit crazy. So I had to 3D print this tile. Again, so I had to 3D print this whole thing again. Yeah, just don't leave them in a hot car for a long time or they will melt. Um, the other really interesting project I've been working on over the last uh, year or so is uh, with the Northern Land Council to support, support uh, Gunjaitany Aboriginal Corporation in their work with Earth Resources Australia, who is now owned by Rio Tinto on what is now a, I think it's a $2 billion rehab project on the Ranger Uranium Mine. Um, and that's a, a fascinating project because, you know, for so long, uh, all the Mirar folks just wanted nothing to do with that place. It's such a sad story for them. But now to be able to go back onto that country again, they can see the end in sight. They can see that something's happened. They're sort of keen to, to engage and be involved. So a really neat thing um, to be able to be involved in that project and try and create something which helps translate a lot of this complex sort of scientific sort of rehab um, sort of stories into a format that can be laid back to the TOs, but also conversely getting some of their knowledge back to um, uh, ERA and Rio. And, you know, the folks that I've met from ERA, and the only reason ERA exists anymore is for this um, rehab project. Um, and fortunately, they've been bought out by Rio because Rio can't afford not to do a good job and it's going to cost them a lot. So um, it just does surprise me that my engagement in this has been really the only significant thing they've done with the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that they've spent to try and sort of coordinate or sort of link the scientific knowledge they're developing back to the Indigenous owners and those guys understanding what's going on. So at least they're doing that. Yeah, so we can see uh, on the left, um, uh, that's Chris from the NLC, he's starting to use the model to talk to the Mirror folks. Um, and these guys over here, oh, it's a bit of a gammon photo, obviously set up, but uh, they're the guys involved in the rehab. And they actually are doing a re quite a good job. This was interesting. So I presented this at a um, uh, board meeting uh, for, for ERA, where a lot of folks flew up from Perth or wherever they are to Darwin. And what we've done here, we've taken out the mine tiles and we've slotted in the tiles that show how they want it to be. So a little <coughs> modern version of where they're going to. Um, and a lot of these executives, you know, I don't know what salary they're on, but um, there was one of the first times that they also really got exactly what they were doing and what was going on. 
So even at ERA Settlements is great. You need to print one for us as well. So they have now got one of these so they can help their internal communication. The other thing they've done is sort of spent a lot of money and a lot of time on that sort of water flow model at the, um, the end result of this. So one of the things that we do is start to sort of display that over the top so they can explain to um, themselves but to others um, where they might get sort of sediment off flow in the landscape. So, yeah, the, the, it's been good to be able to view it in that way. The next thing we're, we're doing is starting to develop a sort of multimedia cultural interactive database, which we sit on the top of this. Um, I've got a guy who's not here at the moment, but Ashish is my sort of tech guy who's starting to develop this. And what we've been asked for by ERA is not just to have an interface with uh, information that they already have, but have an interf interface that will act as a database and they can pull new stuff in as they collect stuff from the field. Um, and this is just a very, very basic prototype that Ashish sent me last night. But uh, basically, you'll have the 3D landscape and you'll be able to click on these different elements and they'll pop up with uh, photos or videos of people talking about the country. Um, yeah, so we don't have a very good prototype of that yet, but that's where we're heading with this. Um, so I've also been doing a lot of work um, in the North Kimberley over the last couple of years. Um, so initially with um, uh, DCBA Parks and Wildlife in Kununurra. So they've got this wonderful national park in the middle of Kununurra, Miramar National Park. This one here, but there are a lot of people, particularly in the East Kimberley, there's a big sort of um, group of people who really don't understand Savannah and Savannah Fire Management and what parks are doing in this landscape. So I developed this tool that incorporates all the sort of uh, uh, fire derived information I produce through my work with uh, fire managers um, and simulations of fire spread, and they're going to be using that for their sort of public outreach and communication projects get people on board with their prescribed 30 activities. I also printed the whole of the North Kimberley. So this is the whole of the North Kimberley in 3D and we're displaying over this a whole lot of different um, uh, fire regime metrics. Uh, this photo is from um, a um, WA DFIS, Department of Fire Emergency Services uh, commander talking to the volunteer brigade in Broome and explaining, using this model to explain to them the nature of broad scale fire across the North Kimberley. Uh, this is the model with the Dambi Mangari ranges just north of Broome there, um, manage a lot of country. And over this, I'm displaying a day-by-day uh, -day animation of this um, fire history. So you can actually look at particular fire events and fire years, and they're using this to sort of talk through what's happened in the past. So these Dambi Mangari ranges, um, really can see the value of this. So this work I'll be doing uh, this year is a fire simulation specifically for their country. And they're hoping to put that in the art centre at, um, at Derby, the name of which I forget right now. So just to go through some methods, I did mention there's, a, there's this sand approach, which I think is great. I really quite like the idea that you're um, working with the earth or sand when you're creating these landscapes. This was a presentation at RMIT. So you see all these sort of suit wearing academics down on the ground playing in the sand, a lot of fun. As I said before, when you put the projection over the top, you actually get really quite a detailed um, uh, sense of the map. And it's fun if you go into um, the theatre of that as well, you get a big bucket of sand and you chuck that down first and you get people sort of moulding that and playing with that before you do the projection over the top is nice. So there's this 3D printed version. Um, so that I showed you this before. So that is a time lapse of about 11 hours of printing. Watching a 3D printer is about as fun as watching paint dry. Um, the technology generally I find pretty underwhelming, but um, with multiple printers. So this is my setup around the corner there now. Um, I can run five printers. So it'll only take a week or two to produce a fairly large landscape. Um, and as I said, the nice thing about the 3D printed version is once you turn the light off, you still have information there. You don't have anyone's story explicit on that landscape. You know, there's a lot of, lot of literature, literature around um, the process of colonisation and uh, land ownership and mapping and all of that sort of stuff. And particularly in the GIS mapping space, it's around sort of taking knowledge and taking space. So with this approach and the 3D printed approach, you have that the version, there is knowledge there and the fact that you're using this sort of satellite derived 
uh, version of the landscape, but there's nothing really explicit, so that's quite nice. So I've also done quite a bit of work printing built landscapes. So I 3D printed every single house and shop and building in Mangreda a few years ago. Um, this was for a project that was going to look at uh, sort of emergency response um, and preparedness amongst those communities. Then COVID hit, this never went out to Madame Greta and I have no bloody idea where it is these days, but that was a, a good idea at the time. Um, also been doing quite a bit of work recently exploring, um, so this is Darwin City, I've got those models over there, using, so we've got um, high resolution LiDAR 3D data before the whole of Darwin um, and the campus. So just been developing some techniques where I could um, print the city. This was given to me by emergency services. They were interested in potentially using this to be able to colour code sort of different cladding on buildings when they were thinking about their response. Um, recently printed um, this campus um, at quite a large scale as well, which facilities quite liked. Um, just another example of how you can use the 3D version without projection because there's information there. So this was to support a PhD student um, who was doing work on red pandas in Nepal. Um, and obviously people in those landscapes, they know that landscape intimately by the, the terrain or topography. So he took that out um, and was able to use that to get do like this pass, old pass through GIS or so community mapping or modelling without any information which they could add by hand. So just to summarise the stuff around uh, projection augmentation, Am I running out of time? No, that's good. Okay. Um, so it's dynamic, interactive. I think it can really support learning, teaching, sharing, discussing. And this thing I'm going to talk about next, being able to explore complex systems and ambiguity, science communication, traditional ecological knowledge. And I've found it to support this sort of two-way learning, but you can, can have these sort of scientific data sets underneath. So if you've got solid sort of evidence basis, that you can then try and communicate is quite useful. And for me, as I say, working at the blunt edge of technology, for me, it's really important that it's portable, it's robust, it doesn't break, it's cheap and it's scalable. So, you know, you can do it at mini size, big size. I mean, I always thought it'd be great to have one of these projectors in a basketball court mm -hmm. and having sort of a, a truckload of sand and being able to walk through and build up landscapes that way, you know, a bit of performance art or something that haven't got there yet. Um, oops. So I did, did publish, I'm trying to publish as I go along, uh, the end result of some of this work will be a PhD, is the plan. Um, but yeah, so uh, International Journal of Applied Geography, 2019, I published a bit about this work with Scott and the guys in, um, in Mexico. <laughs> so for me, this idea of complex systems, keep mentioning is quite important. So I wanna run through that quickly. Um, what is agent-based modeling? Um, simulation modelling approaches and some examples of my work in this space. So the software that I use is called NetLogo. Um, it's commonly known as agent-based modelling software. It's free open source software, so anyone can download it and use it. Um, the, um, it's supposed to be sort of different, uh, so a simple coding platform. When I started, not having a coding background, it took me a little while, but um, it is pretty straightforward. Um, and NetLogo is commonly used to explore complex systems and emergency emergent properties as most agent-based modelling um, systems are. For me, what was really key is being able to add the temporal dimension to these static GIS uh, data sets I've been working with. So what is agent-based modelling? It's where you've got two agents or things that can do something and the way they interact with each other and mod modify each other's behaviour. So the classic version of this is... Um, the bird flocking model, which many of you probably have heard about. And this is where each bird moves through the landscape based on the behaviour of the bird next to it. And the, the hypothesis is this how birds flock and fish school is based not on any one bird being a lead bird, but it's the interaction between those things. You get these sort of emergent property patterns. So that's the pl classic sort of version of um, order from complexity, I guess. 
A similar idea is that's called cellular autonomy, a similar idea, but in this case, we're working with cells and the way cells interact to, to create order. And the classic sort of model of this is called Conway's Game of Life, where you get very simple rules about how each cell reacts based on their neighbouring cell. And you get these, uh, like these little animals that emerge out of um, these simple rules. So agent-based modelling can use both cellular autonomy and uh, agent -based, traditional agent-based modelling tools. Now, what I've been doing is placing them into the spatially explicit data sets from my GIS background, either remote sensing or derived data sets or from other formats. And then we can have um, both cellular autonomy or agents um, interacting through these um, uh, GIS derived data sets. And um, it's been described as geo, geo simulation or geospatial simulation. Um, an important Concepts, a couple of important concepts within this is that uh, modelling is a creative act. We're not about not trying to recreate the world inside a, com a computer. Essentially, to a large extent, you can't do it. I mean, with very large computers, BOM does a reasonable job at recreating the world in terms of what the weather's going to be like tomorrow, maybe a few days' time. But the, the limits of predictability and complexity, complex systems, you get to very quickly. Um, so the point in trying to sort of recreate the world in computers, uh, I think, is uh, reaches its limit pretty quickly. But what we're trying to do is understand how that system works. The other thing that's really important is keeping the model simple. The more little sort of variables or widgets you add to it doesn't necessarily make the model any more realistic because you're not really describing a real world anyway because you've just got a computer. What it does is generally sort of confuse people or confuse the way that system works. So you've got to balance a level of meaningful, being meaningful with a useful simplicity. Oops. So I'll just talk through some of this GI simulation for fire behavior modeling. Fire is a great thing to, to work in this space because it is a really classic complex system. So the way fire, fire behaves, is based on wind, temperature, humidity, curing, and fuel load, which all operate over multiple spatial and temporal scales. So you can have sort of a uh, continental scale sort of um, weather system, but also you'll have local weather systems. And then how the wind moves over a particular landscape will depend on that topography. It can change in the space of metres or centimetres. And you can have wind gusts during the day, but you'll have weather systems working, working its way over through a, a week. If you're looking at fuel load, for example, that can change throughout the year, but fuel loads will change over several decades. So you've got all of these complex interacting sort of systems. These little bubbles at the top here is sort of showing uh, what data, how much data you can actually capture to describe these systems, which is next to nothing. And there's a big industry now using sort of predictive fire modeling to support emergency services. But the, the accuracy and value of those um, you know, needs to be moderated by a good understanding of what they can and can't actually achieve. What I'm actually trying to do is use this sort of fire modelling to understand the boundaries of the state and getting people to understand the nature of emergent um, properties and unpredictable systems. So you only need one ember to spot over a road and your fire goes into a completely different state and can sort of Keep, keep going forever. But where that ember is going to spot is very, very difficult. It's actually generally impossible to predict. But that unpredictability is, is key. And it's not only in, in physical systems, in social systems, there's so much in unpredictability, which is really important. Think back to the 2016 election. No one thought we were going to get the guy that we did, but um, this firebrand jumped the road and then we've got this whole new state. Um, I mean, this, this gag worked better a few years ago. I could probably sort of update it with some of the new sort of unpredictable outcomes um, that we're seeing at the moment, you know, what happened in Wuhan and all those sort of things. So it's really those unpredictable sort of outcomes which actually are the most important ones. So this is just a, a quick um, video of what we display over the top of this, where we're looking at vegetation, fire, history, where your roads and rivers are, where it stop fires, where you get... This one, differential curing, maybe I'm not showing them all. Um, but we can like it, simulate a fire event under really bad fire weather conditions. So this is going up through Spinifex country near Catherine George, <laughs> and it won't go out. In order to control that fire, you need to put in that burn under really mild weather conditions. So we put the fire danger setting right down, change the wind speed so it's light, and then we put a, a burn through and see how that goes. 
It burns a nice break, but at night time, when it gets cooler, more humid, wind speed drops, the fire goes out. So now if you have that uh, same fire event later in the year, it's stopped by that burnt country. So it's just a really super fast way to explain to people how you use fire to manage fire. From my perspective, it's obvious, but for a lot of people conceptually, they don't understand how you use fire to manage fire. So that illustrates that concept. The other thing I'm trying to do with this is add this sort of gamified element where people can play through um, their interaction with it. So in this case, you can add a protected area. If it burns, you get this crazy outcome. We start a fire and then you can try and put in fire breaks to stop that fire. This example, I put in not a very good fire break. It's quite good doing this live, particularly with kids. They're quickly trying to put the fire break in, but that for that fire gets through and here's that known burn area and the whole thing explodes. It's sort of like that where, where, where sound effect should be there saying, you know, game over, you're failed. But setting kids up, so this is what we've done out in Royal Shore in town, you get one kid drawing a protected area, another kid trying to put in breaks to stop that fire getting through and then seeing if they're, they're successful. So that, I still have a long way to go, but that idea of sort of goal-oriented or gamifying these approaches, um, I think is really useful. Everyone loves a competition. So talking about simplifications, I worked for many years with Bushfires NT and I started at that sort of larger landscape level and then I was looking at how they could use it to communicate um, to um, their rural block owners. And I kept developing these versions and making them simpler and simpler and they kept saying, make it simpler, make it simpler. And we ended up with uh, first a Nip logo version and then this online version, um, which has a really nice interface, not much going on. But uh, we have these houses, we've got gamber grass, and you can line it up. So if you go to this, it's go.cdu.edu.au, fire sim, you'll get this online version, and then you can have a play with gamber grass and fire and protecting your fuel loads. Um, and now this has been used quite extensively by Bushfires NT, it's part of their um, promotion program. Um, and what we've also done is made a 3D projection augmented version of this. So we've 3D printed these little houses and we put it over sand um, and we get young and old burning down houses, putting in gamba, trying to protect stuff. And it's been, been a really useful approach. So uh, Bushfires NT and the Weeks branch now use this as one of their standard sort of outreach tools. And they're over in building Red 1 today. So at the same time, we've got Santos Science Week here. Um, and I've got Bushfires NT and Weeks branch running this here today, which is, which is nice. And once again, for, for me, one of the important things about this is getting people learning through teaching themselves. So this idea of more of sort of a heuristic style where you're not going around and telling people, this is what you should do. You don't just do rural block owners, but all of it's not as like being told, but if people, you can get people to teach themselves and then come and tell you, oh, that's not why, that's why we should control gander here, or that's why we should do this and that through that experiential learning. It's been quite successful. Um, so just talk a little briefly about um, this, work in terms of um, STEM um, outreach. So for a couple of years, um, not so much this one, but more the uh, this Jarwin Nipperlook model, um, I ran an unfunded STEM program for two years, did a few hundred kids a, a year across the, mostly in Darwin. Um, but I just couldn't get any sort of um, funding to, to keep that going. Um, and Department of Education showed some interest, but they've got no money. No one seemed to have any money for the STEM space, so I couldn't continue that. I found it quite exhausting. It was quite a satisfying thing to do, but uh, there was no, seemed to be a lot of talk about STEM, but no, no funding in that space, so gave that one up. Um, some of the other work I've done is, uh, this was for Territory NRM, this is looking at gamber grass spread, um, <laughs> some little cars driving around, animals dry, um, moving gamber around. Um, this is sort of to illustrate risks of um, the way gamber moves. And gamber, like other things, I mean, you, you only need one, one gamber grass to head out to Central Island land for that sort of to take off. Um, so it's difficult to model exactly where it's going to appear. So that's where an agent-based model is quite useful. Um, the stuff that I'm working on at the moment, this is um, for, once again, Territory NRM and um, Tiwi uh, land resources around their 
Um, buffalo land management, so this is a work in progress that's looking at buffalo control, um, buffalo colour and impact on the landscape. And we'll have this as a way that people can sort of fiddle with different parameters and, and checking out outcomes. Done a bit looking at access to emergency services and evacuation modelling. Um, so for many years, I worked on projects in Eastern Indonesia looking at maternal and neonatal health and access to emergency health services and developed a range of models to try and um, help people understand where they should be putting health services. One of these was a net logo based interactive uh, travel time assessment model. Um, which allowed people to, instead of just having one static version of what, what access you had where, you could set different parameters of uh, weather and different forms of access, times of day, um, to get different outcomes, and did explore in projecting this over 3D landscapes. Now, this project hasn't gone anywhere, but I think there is real potential in this space because where you put roads, bridges, um, health services or whatever, it depends on the terrain, it depends on where you can go as much as anything. So being able to visualise that I think could be quite useful. This was, uh, developed this with a, a student from Vanuatu, and this was looking at, um, you see these little men being picked up by cars or little people in boats. So this was looking at evacuation and modelling from a uh, volcano. Um, I think that's the end of the story. So this website, landscapemodels.net, um, has a little bit more background to this, this work. 